So normally um, I do record the lectures and then they are available on our YouTube channel, which we have for various courses. Uh, if we need to discuss certain things or if you need to give me feedback or if we just want to have kind of discussion that doesn't need to end up on, on YouTube, then I will tell you that it's off record and then you can kind of, uh, you know, turn on your cameras or speak more freely. Otherwise, um, try to um, avoid turning your camera on or speaking if you don't want to be um, present on the on the recording. It's kind of to protect your, your privacy, right? Um, okay, so once again, um, this is our first lecture, so we will not do a lot of work. We will do a little bit of organizing and we will be using the uh, Mentimeter. So um, you can go there, but I will also be uh, sharing my screen and I will be discussing you know, the logistics of the course. So first things first, uh, we have the GitLab. So here is the, uh, the main project for the, for the course. Uh, we will be using the repo. I haven't put anything in the repo yet, but we will be using the Git repository and we will be using the wiki and the issue tracker. Uh, issue tracker has a couple of categories. Um, so, uh, I mean, the labels for the issues. And we try to coordinate between the courses such that we have some sort of a cohesive uh, labeling system. So the most important is the announcement. So all the announcements related to the course or to some of the scheduling of the lectures will be done here. So I will make an issue and then, you know, it's good if you subscribe to, to, to the announcements. We will not be using Blackboard. Um, there are various reasons for not using Blackboard. The main reason is that after you finish your third year, you will never see Blackboard ever again. And it's totally useless you know, tool for your future career as a software developer or any other career, to be honest, uh, unless you want to be a teacher and use Blackboard as your tool. Um, so there is not a lot of value of using Blackboard. Uh, there is value of exposing you to Jira, of exposing you to version control systems, to GitLab and GitHub and things like this, which are kind of tools that we use and, and work as a software developers. Uh, Blackboard doesn't have any kind of appeal. Um, and it doesn't offer a lot of useful things neither. So, um, I mean, I, I'm not saying, you know, it's totally useless, but it's not the most liked or loved piece of software, to be honest. So we're not gonna use Blackboard. I may use Blackboard for some announcements um, to reach the entire class, but other than that, uh, all the announcements will be done here. All the other uh, labels are for us to use as we see fit. So we can um, use it for asking questions about the course, uh, discussing tools and environment and things like this, right? Um, so feel free to use it, feel free to ask questions and to provide answers to other students. If you see that you can contribute something. Um, and then the other thing that we heavily use is Wiki. Uh, so with Wiki, um, just, just give me a second, my wife cannot get into the garage. Sorry for that. Yeah, apologies, uh, you know, advantages or disadvantages of working from home. Uh, you know, it's minus 10 outside. If she cannot close the garage door, I'm gonna be freezing here in 20 minutes. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so we're gonna use um, the wiki as well. Most of the information will be provided here and I will be keeping track of the lectures um, in the lecture tab. 
here. So <laughs> we will kind of have schedule for the course of what we're doing in the, in the course. And then we will have some resources and resources and so on. So you know, you know how the wiki works. So we'll have a number of things here. And I'm kind of expecting you to check, check things out. Um, if I need some particular attention to something, I will kind of tell you. Otherwise, you know, keep checking things and um, I, uh, check with the announcements of what is being changed and so on. Uh, the course. Um, the course has uh, two components. One is the internal portfolio, which is some of the hands-on work that we're gonna do in the course. And the other one is the written exam. The written exam is worth 40%. Um, the, um, the internal portfolio is worth 60 and it's kind of the, you know, the bulk of what is expected. Um, for the internal portfolio, because we're running the course for the very first time, I haven't uh, froze exactly how it's gonna look like, but uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a number of small, very short programming assignments uh, that you will do and submit using Git. Um, and then at the, towards the end of the semester, we will have kind of a larger group project where you do a little bit bigger uh, coding for the, for the project as a group. Um, that will kind of constitute your portfolio. And then in the exam, uh, we will have some theoretical questions and we will have some kind of short programming questions. And the exam is done in Inspera and it's an open book exam. So you will be able, of course, to use internet. You're not supposed to collaborate you know, with other people, but you, know, you can just use internet and, and do uh, look things up and so on. So that's uh, the, the two main components. Do you have any questions so far with, uh, with that? Let me just quick the chat. There is, uh, there is quite a lot of snow in Jovik. Um, I have probably about a meter uh, around the house. It's minus 10 right now. Uh, yes, the short assignments will be individual. Um, the group assignment will be group. So for all the short assignments, uh, it is individual. However, there is a catch. And the catch is that I don't mind you collaborating on the individual assignments, okay? So if three of you or you know whoever wants to work together, I'm fine with that as long as all of you understand what the code does and how the code works, right? So even though um, you have to submit the assignments, all the assignments individually, it's fair play for you to work on the assignments together, okay? That's fine. Um, what is not fair play is to be a free rider, right? So if you join a group, you collaborated on something and you did nothing, and then you submitted it, um, well, that's not kind of fair, right? So you have to balance, kick out the free riders and don't help them. But if you have mutually helping each other, that's fine. Um, I don't want you, you to be isolated. I want you to sort of uh, help each other and that's fine. Uh, also, you can find sometimes solutions on Stack Overflow or things like this, that's fine too. Um, you don't have to reinvent everything yourself. I mean, you know, most stuff in programming has been already written like you. In this course, chances are you're not gonna create a unique, you know, creative piece of code which nobody ever wrote before. Uh, so it's fine if you copy something from somewhere as long as you understand what it does and how it works. Uh, the main point here is not to submit the assignments. The main point here is for you to learn how stuff works, right? Uh, and if you can do it in a group, that's great. Uh, when I was a student, we had uh, very heavy math in the first two semesters. And um, I was one of the students who, 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 who got into the university from my high school with 15 other guys. Like we, we, we all 15 of us went to the same high school and went to the same university. And, you know, we worked on the math problems like in group of about 10 people. Uh, and we were kind of helping each other and solving the math problems and kind of teaching or like how to understand certain things. And that worked great for me. And I see no, um, I, I see a lot of benefits of you doing that as well. It's a little bit hard in the remote settings, 
uh, because uh, you're not in the same kind of campus and, and so on. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's fine. So <clears throat> I have written in collaboration with some other lecturers, uh, some sort of expectation uh, document, which explains some of those expectations and some of those, those rules here, right? Um, so yes, we're gonna use GitLab, we're gonna use Discord. Uh, we are expecting you to um, demonstrate professionalism in such a way that when you're submitting something, usually this should be commented. Um, that you know like if you did it to somebody else in your team or at your work uh that it should have a readme file like what it is what assignment it is what's your name and you know some some documentation elements um that you've linted your code that it has proper formatting that you've used a, you know correct naming conventions and things like this it's assumed we're not gonna require that but if you don't do that, like, you know, you're going to be somewhat discouraged not, not doing that, right? So point number five is kind of important. Um, uh, point number six is about collaboration. So that's what I said. Like, it's fine to collaborate on the individual assignments. Um, if you copied something from Stack Overflow, just say, you know, I've got that from Stack Overflow. That's okay. Uh, but you are kind of expected to understand what it does. Like if you copied something and you don't know what it does, then you should not submit it. You can, you have the right to submit something only if you understand what it does, how it works. If you don't, then don't submit it because that's clearly not demonstration of your, you know, capabilities. Um, so searching internet and so on is, um, um, is all fair play. Um, you, you guys can see my screen, right? Just to confirm. Yeah, good. Um, uh, copying source code from online materials and from books, all, all, all fair play. You just need to reference. Uh, so we, um, the plagiarism rules say that if you don't credit something or someone who originally created something, then you are potentially plagiarizing somebody else's work. But if you credit that person, you can copy and paste it, right? So if there is an assignment and you found the solution and you say, oh, I found the solution here, it, it, here it is, and you understand how it works, you can kind of you know, uh, briefly say how it works in a readme file, it's fine, it's accepted, no, no, no problems. Um, so that's about plagiarism kind of here that you, uh, you have to credit of where stuff comes from, right? So if you're doing, for example, a, an assignment and like it's three of you kind of working on it, you can say, yeah, I worked with, you know, Bob and Alice on this assignment. That's fine. Uh, there is no sharing grade or anything like this. Um, all right, um, one important thing that I want to stress is that um, I talk a lot, I, I rant a lot also, uh, and there is a lot of additional information that happens in lectures. Um, so some of it will be recorded, some of it will not be recorded, and none of it is kind of in the lecture slides or anything like this, right? So for your own sake, if you find something interesting or if you find something important, you have to take your own notes. Uh, I'm not gonna prepare lecture notes for you, right? So um, you, um, so I have it somewhere that you're supposed to take your own lecture notes. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's, um, I don't remember where it is, but it, it is in one of the points that you are taking your own uh, lecture notes. Another point that is important, which I just caught, caught my eye here, is that we will give you work to work at home, right? We don't always check it and we don't always enforce it. But for your own sake, uh, if you don't do that, what will happen is towards the end of the semester, you will kind of accumulate a, a backlog of tasks or, or, or work that will be much more than you can chew on, in, you know, on a weekly basis. Uh, so we kind of expect you to work regularly throughout the semester. I know it's hard. I know it's easy to postpone certain things until later, but some things kind of should not be postponed because they will kind of hinder your progress. So if, we, if I say you should read chapter one, two, three, 
for next week, please read it. Otherwise, if you say, ah, you know, I catch up later, then later you will have to read chapters one to 15 and that may take you, you know, 20 or 30 hours. Uh, if you have it spread over three or four weeks, then it will be much of an easier task to do rather than postponing it until later. Um, you know, on average, everyone is kind of expected to work 10 to 15 hours per week. Uh, but that's an average, right? Some of you are very smart and some of you will work, you know, two hours and that's sufficient for you, right? So what does it mean? That for some of you, 15 is not enough. You will need to work 20 or 25 hours, right? Because the average is 10 to 15, right? So for some of you who are really, you know, fast and or already know certain things, that time is lower. For some of you, that time will naturally be higher. So it's not uncommon for people to have to work twice as much as and somebody else's, uh, somebody else. Um, the the ratio between kind of uh, good programmers, uh, basic programmers, or kind of really really good programmers is in the industry is known to be of a factor of 20, right? So if a really good programmer can do something in one hour, kind of another programmer may take 20 hours to achieve the same result, right? That's not uncommon. Um, so the gap is quite big. So you have to adjust, right? So some of you will have to work more. I mean, what, what I mean by that is like, you just need to spend more time with stuff. Uh, some of you will spend less time. Um, all right, so taking notes for the lectures yourself. Um, and then there is this kind of self-explanatory. I will not go over all the all the rules here. Um, they, they have been evolving. Um, so I don't think there is anything controversial here. Um, if you have some feedback or if you want something to be discussed, just uh, ping me. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, Yeah, so yeah, th th this is kind of a, a hard question to answer. Uh, I, as I said, like th those 10 to 15 hours per week is an average, right? Uh, we used to have a solid 15 when the course was 15 points. Uh, now the course is seven and a half, so it should be kind of on a 10, uh, 10 hours uh, range. But at the same time, the, the course is a little bit more challenging. Uh, so we, we will adjust it. I mean, it should not go way above the 10 to 15, but as I said, it's quite hard for a very um, diverse group of students. Some of you will like, you will zoom through the material and there will be no hurdles. For some of you, it will be hard and we have to find this balance, right? So it, it is not a leftover from 10 point course uh, because we didn't have course like this before, which was 10 points. But this is my expectation of how much you will have to put in. Uh, on average, you should put in about 15, um, um, 15 work hours, including the lecture time, which we have four hours uh, with, right? So every week we have four hours together. And then the, there is, you know, approximately 10 hours left. Um, so I mean, we will see how it how it goes. Uh, you should not work. Um, I mean, we discussed this those things with other study programs as well. So I, I had a discussion with the North University uh, last week with, with a guy who is working there. Um, and he said that students over there, they tend to spend 50 to 60 hours per week working, right? And 60 hours a week, it's a kind of a heavy week. Uh, it's, you know, uh, six days, 10 hours a day. So it's quite a lot. So he says that it's quite a lot also. Like it would be better if students were working like 40 to 50 hours, right? Uh, but he's noticed that this 40 to 50 hours is not enough. They, they need to spend more time. So then there is a question, okay, sh should we lower the material? Should we lower the expectations? But then you, you kind of graduate and being handicapped a little bit because other people know more and they are kind of uh, better equipped. Right, so uh, you know we we don't work you to to work too much. Like you should not work more than those forty to fifty hours per week. But at the same time, you you do need to put some work in. Right, so we will kind of be adjusting. If you find yourself working fifteen hours per week for this course and still not kind of being able to catch up, let me know. 
we will kind of uh, find the the solution or find the you know reason why 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 it's why it's like that. Um, all right. Any more questions about the um, the logistics? So to sum up, we, we're using Discord, we're using GitLab. Um, you uh, expect it to, to work, you expect it to check the rules. Uh, you can copy stuff and you can read online things and you can reuse uh, work from internet into the assignments. Uh, you are encouraged to work collaboratively on individual assignments, uh, but make sure that you credit whoever should be credited. Uh, don't take ownership for stuff that is not directly yours. And then make sure that whatever you submit, you understand. Uh, even if it was copied and pasted from Stack Overflow. Um, and the same rules apply for the exam with the exception that in the exam, you're not allowed to collaborate anymore, right? So exam is individual and you're not supposed to collaborate on exam questions and during the exam with anybody else. It has to be only you and only you submitting your own work. You can still look things up. You can still uh, use internet, but no collaboration is allowed. That would be considered cheating. Um, all right, so I think we covered um, the logistics. Um, any questions? No questions so far? Okay, so before I go through the lecture slides, um, I had noted uh, two more things here. Uh, one is about the operating systems that you guys using. Um, and the other one is about the environment that you're using. So I'm using Mac and I'm quite familiar with Mac. I'm also quite familiar with, um, with Linux. So if you have any Mac or Linux questions, you know, ask me anything. Uh, if you have Windows problems or if you have to learn something about Windows, then Ask Christopher. Christopher is another lecturer. You will have a cloud computing with him and, and myself. Uh, and he is the Windows guy. So he's using Windows on every day. Uh, and he will be able to answer your Windows questions more. OK. For this course and for most of the courses, we quit pretty agnostic what underlying operating systems you're using. Uh, so just use whatever you use, whatever you like. Uh, in the cloud course, it will be easier if you're using Linux, uh, so if you're not using Linux for your everyday work, then you will be asked to prepare a virtual machine, like you know, uh, virtual box or something like this with Linux on it, and then you will do certain things with Linux. Um, personally, I know it. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, what you use, uh, you can be very productive in, in any of those, uh, you know, modern operating systems. Um, I just found that um, operating systems which give you more rich uh, command line facilities, they are making me more productive. So I found myself, you know, I used Windows in the long time ago. Uh, but when I migrated to Linux, I found myself to be more productive because it gave me much richer command line experience than Windows. Okay, I know Windows caught up, and like the modern um, modern Windows has Bash built in, and you have all the command line facilities almost as everything else. Uh, but um, I kind of stuck with the Linux-like systems, like Mac. Is almost like Linux uh, because it has a BSD kernel and it has uh, Bash and all the shell kind of facilities. And I have all the GNU tools on it as well. Um, but it's up totally up to you. Uh, one thing, though, I will tell you is that during your studies, during the course of those, you know, uh, one and a half years left, ex 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 uh, experiment, right? So if you are a Windows user, try to do more things with Linux. If you are a Mac user, try to do more things with Windows or with Linux. Try something outside of your comfort zone and learn about it, right? That, that's why you're here. That's why you are a student, right? 
you don't have to get stuck to what you currently got stuck with just experiment like that's what i did like i was a, a stuck windows user and i experimented with linux back in a day and i sort of switched right uh so do the same maybe, maybe you will like one more than the other okay um Funny story was that when I was a student again, we were using Windows for most of everything. And then I, I went for an internship to, uh, to England and I was doing my master's degree there. And it was really interesting because um, in, in Birmingham where I was studying, all the computer labs which had Windows were for non-programmers. All the Windows computer labs were kind of a generic computer labs for anybody else. But the computer science students computer labs were only old fashioned um, mainframes and the Unix machines. Like we, we had DEC, uh, uh, DEC, kind of a digital equipment corporation, Unix machines. And we could only use Unix. We couldn't use Windows for anything, right? Uh, so that was kind of an, an interesting experience. And I was quite lucky that I knew Linux from before going there because I, I would be kind of stuck. Um, so they enforced this kind of a Unix philosophy in into all computer science uh, students. And I found it kind of uh, interesting and, and it gives you a certain sense of um, how things are designed and how things work. Uh, so yeah, try things out. So that's the operating systems. Um, in terms of IDE and, um, and uh, kind of a programming facilities, Again, we are very agnostic. Uh, we will not tell you what to use. Um, I, I personally use kind of different tools. I use IntelliJ, I use Vim, and I use uh, Visual Studio Code, depending like what I need to do. Uh, some of them have some facilities for some programming languages, which are better than uh, the other ones. So I, I'm kind of using those three. Um, I really like Vim. So I, I make my keyboard binding to Vim on all those editors, um, even though, so, you know, even in IntelliJ, I'm not using Vim, but I have Vim mode and I'm using Vim commands because they make me a little bit more productive. So if none of, if some of you are using uh, Vim, great. If you never used Vim, try it again, experiment. Uh, maybe you will like it, okay? Uh, but, you know, apart from, trying to encourage you to experiment, we have no requirements. So whatever you use, um, we will be requiring you to submit the Git repositories and the tools you use to generate the code, to write the code, it's up to you, okay? Um, so as I said, I, I have some experience with IntelliJ, uh, NTNU students and staff have the professional license. So if you register with IntelliJ, um, uh, no, with uh, Jet, JetBrains, uh, with your NTNU email address, you can get the student license and then you have the ultimate uh, IntelliJ uh, tool um, for yourself. Uh, just one comment that, the J, let's, let's go to the uh, brain, JetBrains uh, webpage. There is, um, they have quite a quite a number of tools, right? So if I go to the main page, uh, developer tools, they have a number of tools, right? So they have one which is the main kind of IntelliJ, and then they have like for Python, for PHP, for uh, GoLang. So the GoLang is like the um, the tailored tool for GoLang. Um, from experience, we've we've realized that um, if you install yourself IntelliJ, the, the ultimate one, and you have appropriate plugins, you can basically replicate the, the feel of the other tools. So I, I've, I've been using Goland and IntelliJ, but eventually I, I uninstalled Goland because it was basically the same as IntelliJ with the plugins and gives you the same stuff, right? So I would go for the IntelliJ ultimate and install appropriate plugins and then don't bother with the, the, some of the other ones. Uh, some of the other ones might, I, you know, I haven't tested all of them, so I don't know, but I know that for Python, Golang and Java and C++, like some, you know, I, I have the same feel in the ultimate. Um, so that's, um, that's in relation to editors and in relation to tooling. Um, any questions of that? No 
final questions. I um, so when I say try Vim, uh, that's kind of a tricky thing because Vim is kind of hard, <laughs> and you know most people hate it, right, and never use it. Um, so you do you need to give it a, a little bit of time, right? So you do need to learn some of the keyboard shortcuts and the, the mode, how it operates and give it a bit of time. And then maybe you will like it, right? Some people give it a try and they don't like it, uh, but it does make sense. Like uh, on, a, on a meta level, if you think about it, uh, like rationally, uh, some of the keyboard shortcuts and some of the way you work with text and you work with the editor are kind of um, making you more productive, even though it is kind of counterintuitive. It's not necessarily the typical experience of the text editor, right? Um, uh, okay, so are the books in this course? I will come back to this. I will come back to this question after. Uh, any other questions? If not, then... Um, let me, so you, are you using the, the Mentimeter? All right, so then I will do, just give me a second. And just go in. All right, so um, let's do this question. Um, think what programmers use in their day-to-day work the most. What is that the most important thing that they use the most? Awesome. So um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with the answers uh, for a reason that um, the brain and brains kind of uh, uh, are here, right? So the, 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 some, of, some of the things we will talk in this course are kind of a fact and we can kind of validate it and check, okay? Some of the things are kind of opinions and a bit of a ranting, okay? We, we, you know, we cannot avoid rants in this course, so there will be some rants, okay? This is just my opinion, but I think similarly to writers, uh, you know, what writers like novel writers use in their day-to-day -day work, do they use a typewriter or the editor? No, they use their head, right? So the novel happens in their head. The editor and the typewriter and the text, which kind of comes from their finger, is the side effect of the novel being built in their head. The same is with the programmers. Programmers solve problems 
and they solve them by thinking, right? That's your primary objective. That, that's your primary tool uh, that you use in your work. Everything else is important, of course, uh, but you know th this is the this is like the contrast, right? So if you take a person who is only using Stack Overflow and makes kind of a copy and paste things. Uh, and a person who almost never used Stack Overflow, but kind of comes up with solutions, you will have kind of a two end of the spectrum, right? Uh, neither of the, like, you know, they don't exist. Like th those extremes don't exist. We are all somewhere in the, in the middle, right? Uh, but that's like the point of this slide was to kind of highlight that the main tool that you have is your head, it's your brain. Uh, that's what you use. Uh, everything else is secondary and ev nothing else matters as much as your head, right? Um, all right, so next question. Um, so you need some, some questions are kind of totally um, just kind of anonymous, but for this we need to have um, we need to have some way of keeping track of who is where. Th those are kind of a point scoring questions, right? So we have some which are non point scoring and some which are point scoring. Okay, so this one is a point scoring. So. Great. So programming and coding are not synonymous, although they are often used as synonyms, right? Uh, you know, at least at the end of this lecture, you should know that they are not. Uh, this is um, borderline ranting and facts. If you Google that, you will find articles arguing that they are not the same. And I agree. I totally agree that they are not the same. So you could make an argument that they are kind of the same, but most people in the field uh, agree that they are distinct, they have distinguishing feature with the programming being a superset of where coding is inside, okay? So most, if you check things out, most people will agree that programming is kind of a bigger sphere of, uh, of things that happen. Uh, and then the coding is one element of it, right? So. You could say all coding is programming, but not all programming is coding. Okay, if you if you use this a uh, superset subset relationship. Okay, so having that in mind, um, think a little bit of um, you know why they are different and why do we talk about this superset subset relationship, and what would you use uh, to describe what programming is. So use some words which are characteristics of programming. Yeah, looks good. Um, I think um, all those are, are, are very good. Uh, problem solving kind of seems to be quite used a lot, which which is probably fine. Like it's it's correct way of thinking about it. Um, we do have. Um, okay, so so let, let's postpone the, the discussion for a moment. So then the, the next one is, um, what would you describe, what words would you use for coding?
Yeah. So uh, as you see, the words which I used here are different to the words which we used just before, but there is a little bit of overlap, right? So here we focusing much more on directly instructing the machine what to do. So we kind of focus on the, you know, the instructions or the implementation of how the machine should achieve certain things. In programming, we're thinking more of what, but we also think on how, right? It's just a matter of different level of, um, of abstraction. So if I, for example, specify in a pseudocode how stuff should work, I'm kind of doing programming. But then if I'm taking the pseudocode and converting it to C or C++ or Rust, I'm doing coding, right? So the programmer kind of ne not necessarily think in the direct syntax or direct uh, kind of a code instantiation, which is Rust or C++ or C. I can think about the problem in kind of an abstract terms, specify the solution in pseudocode, and then the person who is doing the coding will convert the pseudocode to Python or to C, right? Or I can give a solution in Python and say, now I need a solution, the same solution in C++. That would be also coding, right? Changing the syntax from Python to C++, that, that would constitute coding. Um, the, the, so sometimes the programmer will specify the particular solution in, the, you know, in Python, right? Uh, and that is kind of where the mixing of um, coding and, and programming sometimes happens. There is this overlap where we cannot really tell, was it clearly coding or was it kind of uh, still a programming? But the character characterization is that when you're thinking about the problem, usually you're thinking about the problem in kind of a more abstract terms that are abstracted away from the concrete programming language that eventually the solution will be encoded in. Right, so when a, 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 a programmer thinks about a, a problem, if I if I tell you, okay, uh, let's implement um, uh, some bookkeeping system for students, right? You may start thinking, okay, yes, we need some sort of type for representing a student. We need to have some sort of representation for courses, for grades. Uh, we need to have some relationships, and you can do all of that. Uh, you can do all of this designing, thinking, and kind of how things work, how things relate to each other, independent of the concrete syntax of C++ or C Sharp, right? You can kind of plan it, you can think about it, you can solve certain problems, and then you can implement them or you can code them using C or C, C Sharp syntax, right? Uh, but the thinking is more abstract. When I'm, when I'm talking about list, uh, I don't mean Python list or I don't mean C++ list. I just mean a list. It can be a Python list or it can be a C++ list, right? If I'm talking about, you know, sorting a list, you know, the syntax on, on the programming language that is kind of implementing it or coding it doesn't matter, right? So if I need to, for example, zip two lists together, then I'm kind of discussing and analyzing some sort of requirement or some sort of problem in abstract terms. Um, if, if you say, oh yeah, we, we need to uh, check if the length of the password is uh, long enough, right? We need to have some conditional if statement, right? This discussion doesn't mean this if, if statement needs to be in Python or it needs to be in C++. It's just an if statement, right? Then it's implemented as a if statement in a particular language. Um, so programming is kind of, is a superset, coding is a subset, and coding has sometimes those kind of a negative connotation that is kind of a monkey typing, right? Um, it, it is true and false, right? It is less mentally demanding to be doing the coding than doing the programming. Uh, but at the same time, even when you're focusing just on coding, uh, there might be some specific language features or specific language uh, things that will present some problems, okay? So, um, yeah, I will just open my, uh, just give me a moment. 
I have the so this is an example. Let's say um, typical kind of use case uh, is JavaScript, right? So in JavaScript, if I do this, uh, what th this is an expression in JavaScript. What this expression will give me? What what will be the result of of this expression? So somebody is suggesting that it will be this. Any other suggestions? One, one, two. Yeah, the, this this as a string. Uh, a string. Yeah. What else can happen? Pretty much those two things you kind of expect, right? Um, all right. So what if I do this? What will happen then? That's one suggestion. Yeah, that people are voting on, on this one. Pretty much that's the only reasonable thing with this one to, to do, right? Uh, with this one, we have two. And if the only reasonable thing for this one is this, then it should logically follow that that should be the reasonable thing for the first one, right? But it's not. This will happen, right? So this is the answer, and this is the answer, right? So you see, it's inconsistent. It's logically kind of inconsistent. And some languages, JavaScript being kind of a perfect example, have a lot of kind of intricacies and certain problems built in into the language. So even as a coder, you may need to be problem solving because the language itself generates certain issues to you, right? Uh, certain things become hard to solve using code because of the language, right? It has nothing to do with the domain. It has nothing to do with what you're currently solving. It has to do with the way you have to code some things, right? So uh, my point being um, that even if you are a monkey, <laughs> Even if you had a monkey, you would not be able to code everything in all programming languages, right? Some programming languages are more fine-tuned for monkeys. Some require actual thinking while you're doing the coding as well, right? But it's not the thinking about the problem. It's thinking about other problems, which are because of the limitations of the tools and things that you're using, OK? Um, all right, so let's have a break. Um, I sometimes. Uh, yeah, uh, I sometimes miss breaks. So then you just tell me in the in the chat that oh, Marius, we need a break. Okay, um, so let's meet back uh, twenty past one. So ten minutes break. Okay.
four more minutes. Come on, wasting time here. <laughs> the breaks are useless. But Right, so what's my favorite programming language? Um, I, well, so the very first language I've learned was assembly on x86 and I didn't like it too much. So after that, uh, I've learned basic um, and I said, oh man, programming in basic, it's so much more fun than assembly. Um, then I've learned Pascal and I said, whoa, man, Pascal is so much more and so much more fun than basic, right? And then I've learned C and I like, wow, I fall in love in C. So I thought C is the best language ever. Uh, then I've learned C++ and I said, whoa, with classes and all those, um, you know, operators overloading and all this thing, it's just magic. It's like fantastic. So I loved C++, but if you look, if you work with C++ for a while and the old old C++, I mean, without all the modern modern features, uh, you start kind of hating it after a while because of all the memory problems and all the stuff that it's really hard to maintain. Uh, the modern C++ is a little bit better. Uh, it allows you to kind of do a more expressive coding and it feels much more modern uh, for, for the standard. So the modern C++ I kind of like, but the old C++ I kind of hate it. Uh, so I've moved to Java <clears throat> and I kind of, again, fallen in love with Java for a while. And I kind of love, love the way that you could express certain things and you had the memory kind of safety and, and so on. Um, but um, I kind of don't really like the old style C++ and, and Java because they are very um, verbose. Like you, you actually have to code quite a lot of boilerplate to get stuff done. Uh, so um, I don't really have kind of uh, the, the, uh, the most favorite programming language. I mean, the, the, the most pleasant one that I've ever worked was, um, was Smalltalk um, and, and Squeak, which was kind of a modern implementation of Smalltalk. It, it had kind of a neat syntax and was quite um, succinct and quite quite nice to work with, but it wasn't very usable like in production. It, it has this kind of large runtime system that you have to carry around with you. And it, yeah, I mean, no, nobody's really using it, uh, but it was kind of nice. Um, so I, I don't really have like a single programming language that I kind of now love completely. Um, I quite like um, Rust and, and Haskell uh, for different reasons. I quite like Go, Golang as well. Um, we have now, we're building a, a project with uh, Golang for 
um, cryptocurrency forensics. And it's a really good language to work on with, um, with other people in a team uh, because the code is quite uh, self-explanatory and it's easy to maintain. And it has all the uh, built-in networking infrastructure. So yeah. All right, let's carry on. Um, so uh, I let you list what programming languages you know uh, or you played with. So let's see. Let's see what you've been exposed to so far. Great. Lua. Okay, so Lua is one of the languages that I haven't listed. Um, all the other ones I've listed. Cool. So that sounds good. Uh, Zik. Zik, I haven't listed neither. PHP I haven't listed. Um, I'm not a big fan of PHP. So yes, so I, I don't have kind of a language that I totally love, but there are some languages that I kind of totally hate. <laughs> and PHP is kind of like, yeah, I totally hate this crap. So yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so let's do, let's do the next question. Um, the next question is, um, okay, what language is that? Yes, great. So um, this is the typical starting point for people learn new programming language, right? So the question is, in which programming languages uh, can you do this? I haven't listed Lua and I haven't listed PHP, but let's uh, do that for those that are listed here. So everyone should be able to do it in Python because in what was on our previous slide, right? So if you couldn't do it in Python before, you should be able to do it in now, right? You just learned how to do it in Python. Um, yeah, there is, wh while you're answering, there is a bit of a story that um, if you need to do hello world in Java, uh, you pretty much need to learn about everything, almost everything Java kind of brings on board because the hello world in Java is very involved. It kind of involves concept of a class. It involves concept of static functions, methods. It involves concept of command line arguments, the arrays. It involves of a kind of a default system object that you have to deal with to, to put something out. So just to start with hello world in Java is an overkill. So most Java, courses, they don't start with hello world because it's just too complex to, to, to do. Uh, you have to start with something simpler. Uh, all right, so majority of people are kind of on the C++, C++ uh, scale of things. And then we have some people who, who did something with Golang and Rust. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, this one. So a dining philosophers is a problem which we often use in computer science to demonstrate um, the con concurrency or, you know, uh, concurrent programming. So you have some philosophers sitting around the table, uh, five of them. Um, you have five plates and five forks. Uh, and the philosophers basically can do one of two things. They either eat because they are hungry 
or they think because they are not hungry and they think, okay? And they do it forever. Like there is no time. So once they start doing this loop, they continue doing it forever, right? So the, there is a catch. The catch is that a philosopher to eat requires two forks. Um, so they cannot eat with one fork. They, they need uh, two forks, right? So if let's say if this guy kind of uh, takes those two forks, then neither this or this guy can eat at the time this guy is eating because he occupies those two forks. So they will be missing one of the forks, right? So there, there are a couple of things that could happen, right? So if we say start and all of them grab the right fork, then nobody can eat and we have kind of a deadlock. So each of them is holding one fork and you know no eating is happening and they are starving, right? Um, also what can happen is one guy can kind of uh, eat and then release the, the forks, but think for a very short time and become hungry again. And he grabs those two forks again before one of those two guys manages to grab the forks, right? So effectively he can eat and think, he eat and think, but because he's such a short thinker, he will starve those two guys out because he will kind of be thinking for not enough time, right? And they will be too slow to, to grab the fork. Or maybe they couldn't grab the fork because, you know, that fork was not available. So, you know, you see the problem, right? So this is kind of a, a typical problem that uh, we have with uh, access to resources and problems like uh, deadlock or problems like starvation, right? So now the next question is, can you do that in the languages that you've listed before, right? So you've listed some languages that you can do hello world in. Can you do dining philosophers in those languages that you've listed before? Yeah, perfect. No, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> well, if you can do it in assembly, then I'm, I'm impressed. Um, you can only see, choose one item. Uh, can you resubmit the answer multiple times? Okay, that then my mistake. Um, so thanks, I will fix it for the next year group. <laughs> um, no resubmit. Submit, that was slide number 11. Okay, uh, if something is wrong, yeah, just let me know. Um, okay, so let's move on. Um, so I have two questions about C11 and C++. So can you quickly do this one? How you read yourself? All right, sounds good. So somewhat skewed bell curve, but towards the good side. Um, that sounds good. Um, all right, another question. Yeah, so uh, you don't really have generics or garbage collector in C++ uh, in, in C11. Um, it kind of introduced the multi-threading and atomics. Um, there are two header files which are exposing some of the functionality in the standard library. Um, all right, so we have, I think leaderboard, what leaderboard first? All right, sounds good. Uh, it's quite uh, 
kind of an exponential kind of thing. So quite flat and then bumps up to the first three people. Well done so far. Uh, so what programming paradigms do you know? So write, um, write the programming paradigms you know and kind of some languages that are associated with it, uh, with that particular paradigm. So very good. Th this one is a little bit hard um, because not um, um, not everyone agrees on certain definitions. Okay. Um, so for example, Golang is sometimes referred as functional because functions are the primary kind of um, uh, mechanisms in Golang, but it's not functional in the same sense as Haskell is, right? Uh, same with object-oriented programming. There are, there are debates on what object orientation really means, and there are um, people who suggest that um, proper object orientation requires facilities such as they were present in Smalltalk, for example, but not necessarily in C++ because in C++, for example, you don't have ability to reason about classes and objects during the runtime. You can only do that in the compile time. Therefore, it doesn't have this kind of a reflection mechanism. Java has it, for example. So Java would be considered more object oriented than C++, for example. But you know, C++ is typically given as an example of object oriented programming. So we will not kind of dive too much here because the, the, you know certain things are quite hard to be precise in deciding the, the paradigm. One thing that is missing here is a logic-based paradigm. Do you, do, you know, do you know what it is and what is the primary example uh, of the language which is using logic? Um, So Prolog, any of you know Prolog? Prolog is a, a example programming language which is using kind of a logic inference as the primary engine, primary mechanism in the um, uh, uh, runtime system. Okay, so um, let's move on. Um, we, uh, we will be discussing a lot of things about programming and about languages, and we need to get our terminology kind of consistent, right? So as, as we were discussing on the previous slide, functional programming, object-oriented programming, logic-based programming, structural programming, um, those are kind of uh, uh, fundamental terms, but they do require additional definitions of what people really mean, right? Um, so for example, Haskell is a functional programming language, but it has laziness, it has pure function, it has immu immutability and so on. Golang doesn't have any of those features, but it's sometimes also called functional, right? Um, it has functions as a first, um, first class citizens in the language, right? Um, so what we need is we need to kind of um, define some, um, some terms which we'll agree on, which are kind of more fundamental, which we can use to describe certain paradigms and certain uh, languages, okay? So what does it mean language is has managed memory? Anyone wants to give it a shot? If you have to Google it, then don't bother, okay? <laughs> if you know, just, just say in chat. Um, No one wants to give it a, a try. 
Yeah, so uh, Java, for example, is a language with managed memory. Um, Golang is also a language with managed memory. Um, languages with managed memory means that some of the memory management is taken care of for you by the runtime system. So you don't need to manage everything to do with memory yourself. Some of the things uh, are managed for you. And then there is a bit of a degree, right? So Rust has certain things that are kind of managed, uh, but it's not language with managed memory in the same sense as Java or Golang is, right? You would say Java and Golang do have managed memory, whereas Rust doesn't, okay? Um, so you have to be, again, a bit more precise, right? Uh, with or without garbage collector, that's easier. Um, so yeah, give, give me languages which have a built-in garbage collector. C Sharp, yes, Java, yes. Rust, does Rust have a built-in garbage collector? No, uh, Haskell? Golang has, yes, Haskell. Does Haskell has? Yes, Haskell has also. All right. Um, what does it mean that the language is a scripting language uh, or that it is a programming language? What would you say is the difference? Well, this is not as clear as the other definitions. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, ranting going on here. Um, you know, by definition, scripting language is for writing scripts, programming language is for writing programs, okay? Um, so Python, for example, uh, has been developed and designed initially as a scripting language, as a glue to write quick scripts, one file scripts to glue functionality which was implemented in C or C++, right? Um, and if you look at, at Python today, by vast majority of Python programmers who are using it for machine learning, it is kind of used like a scripting language. They write a one file scripts which do stuff um, and that's how the language is used, right? So if you look at it from that point of view, Python is a scripting language. Uh, it's not really for building complex multi-file programs. It's for writing scripts. Um, you know, C++ on the other hand, or Rust or Golang are not used in a single file, single script kind of way. They are kind of programming languages. They are used for programming. Uh, JavaScript uh, was designed to be a kind of a single simple scripting mechanism for making some buttons on the HTML page, you know, more active. It has been designed as a scripting language and it's even in its name, right? It's called JavaScript, not Java, right? Java was designed to be a programming language. JavaScript was designed to be a scripting language. Um, but they have a certain use cases and certain history, which is making them being used for programming whether that's bad or not, whether that's good or bad, or you know whether you should use Python for programming, uh, that's another story, right? Uh, but one is for writing scripts, single file, gluing things together, achieving something, programming, multi-files, larger projects, you know, you, you have different kind of requirements for a scripting and programming language. All right, statically typed versus dynamically typed. Um, Statically typed first. Give me some examples of languages which are statically typed. C++ is, Python isn't, yes, Rust is, Java is, yep, good. So uh, some examples of dynamically typed languages. Python, there was one already, other ones. JavaScript, Swift, PHP, yes. So, uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages of dynamically typed versus statically typed. Dynamically typed languages are much easier to write code in because the type system is so flexible that it's much easier to write those uh, single file scripts, right? So historically, 
most scripting languages were dynamically typed because nobody would bother with keeping track of type, right? Uh, for, for stuff, for sh your short scripts. Um, programming languages, on the other hand, were mostly designed for multi-file, multi-project, multi-developer environments, and then having a static type checking compiler, you know, giving uh, um, warnings to certain violations was a very helpful thing and is a very helpful thing, right? So for programming, typically statically typed languages are better in long term because they prevent you doing bugs, which um, can be detected on, at compile time. Uh, whereas dynamically typed languages, they will allow you to do a lot of bugs and they will blow up during the runtime, right? So a lot of Python or JavaScript scripts or programs run kind of, uh, they allow you to run them, but the, the outcome of running them might be different if you had or didn't have those bugs inside, right? Um, so again, we have to balance certain things. I'm, I'm not saying one is better than the other. They kind of always depend what you want to achieve and how much resources you have to throw at things, right? There is no um, single thing fits everything, right? Uh, you should not use Rust for everything and you not should use JavaScript for everything, right? There is a, a, always a good use case for a particular tool or for particular language. All right, so a little bit harder one, with or without type inference. So first give me some examples of language that do have type inference. Yeah, Rust and Haskell do have it. What doesn't? What give me examples of languages that don't have type inference? C. Do you have type inference in C? Or the old style C? No, good. So modern C++, do you have type inference in modern C++? Yeah, exactly, you have auto, right? So yeah, the system will figure out what type the, the shed is in, right? Um, all right, um, declarative versus imperative. So um, do you know any declarative language where you define what things are, not how to do things. Yeah, Haskell is one. And then I mentioned the other one, Prolog. So those are kind of both examples of declarative languages. Everybody, everything else, mostly imperative. But there are some uh, multi-paradigm things sneaking in into, for example, C Sharp, uh, where you have certain constructs using a certain libraries where you actually specify more declaratively what things are, and then the runtime system will execute it accordingly, right? So the language itself, like C Sharp itself, is not really um, declarative, but you or JavaScript for that matter, but you can have through libraries, in, you know, uh, introduce certain declarative features into the language, and they will make the language sort of easier to use or nicer to use sometimes. All right. Um, Compiled versus interpreted versus bytecode. That one is relatively easy. Um, so give me examples of compiled languages. C, C++, yes, Rust. Golang, where, where is Golang? Which, yeah, Golang is also compiled. Interpreted languages. JavaScript, Python, yeah, Lua, yeah, very nice. Um, sometimes we have something which is uh, bytecode based, right? So Java, is Java interpreted language or is Java compiled language? So we do have um, kind of a two step, two steps here. So the Java class, uh, um, the, the, the Java source code, the .java file is initially compiled into the bytecode representation. 
And then the bytecode representation is then subsequently compiled into the machine code using a just-in-time compiler or a head-of-time compiler, right? So we have two steps, two stages, and eventually at the end of the pipeline, we do have machine code, which is the same, which represents the same entity as the source code. So we would say Java is a compiled language. Um, sometimes what happens is you have a language which is compiled into the bytecode and then the bytecode is interpreted. So then we kind of not interpreting directly the source code stuff that we have here. We interpreting the intermediate representation, which is the bytecode. But I would still call that language interpreted because you are kind of interpreting the instructions. You're not compiling it to the machine code at the end of the process, right? So yes, so just-in-time compiler is uh, an example of the, that second step. All right, and then rich versus limited standard library support. Uh, so that is changing, uh, but um, let's, uh, let's not put it to vote. I just tell you that, for example, in Golang, the standard library support is very rich and robust. You have a lot of facilities uh, around networking, encryption, uh, random number generators, like most of the things like HTTP, JSON encoding, all those things are part of the standard library. Whereas in Rust, they are not part of the standard library. The standard library is much more limited, but you get all those extra functionality by additional third party supported libraries. Some of those libraries become sort of standard, standardized, uh, but uh, they are not built in, they are not maintained by the language developers, right? So you may have a kind of a language core, a language developers which maintain and update and do certain things with standard libraries, which is one model. And then another one is that the um, standard libraries are kind of add-ons. They are, they have their own ecosystem and they are added into the language by third party, right? So now the question is which one is better, right? There is no single answer that this is better than this, but there are some trade-offs, right? So one of the trade-offs, which is here, is that these guys cannot change. They cannot have alternative. Let's say I, I need particular implementation of uh, some uh, security protocol, some sort of hashing or something, right? The standard library will give me one, and then I cannot have competing ones. Of course, I can use a library, which will then offer me an alternative. But as a library goes, they, they usually is just kind of a one way of doing things. And they have to find a trade-off, right? Whereas on that model here, you can have multiple alternative ones. And then you pick the one which uh, matches your requirements the, the most, right? Um, but you can say, well, but you know, you can still have libraries with this model, right? So this model is kind of a superset of, of, of this model, right? So in, on, on this comparison, the model with the rich libraries still sort of has an edge, right? The other edge that the model with big li uh, um, standard libraries has is that because the designers of the language are also the designers of the runtime system, they can cheat because they can build in into the runtime system certain things which make the standard library work in certain way, in such a way that a third party library cannot. Because the third party library doesn't have the uh, direct kind of um, um, direct, direct access to those features, which are sort of tailored for the standard library features that the designers put in, right? Um, so that's why, for example, if you want to write a, 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 mem, a mem copy function in Java using Java, you will never beat the mem copy function which is offered to you by the standard library because they effectively cheat, right? They do something that you don't have direct access to. Uh, so you, you are kind of stuck to using the facilities that they offer you, right? Um, the disadvantage, the big disadvantage, so on those two kind of uh, accounts, the, the rich standard library system would sort of win over the tiny one, right? But there is a cost. So the cost is that the uh, rich standard library system needs to be maintained, needs to be uh, tested, needs to be improved, the uh, efficiency, you know, performance needs to be taken care of. And that's a lot of work for the core team of the language. So if the team of the language is quite big and they have a lot of support, they can afford 
doing this kind of a rich library system. Whereas if the team is relatively small and agile, then you can't really take this extra, that, that extra, you know, tasks. So you do have languages which are sort of somewhere on the spectrum uh, and depending on the resources, depending on the funding and depending how backed they are by some kind of a big provider, you, you have it slightly differently, right? But when, when I started this comparison was Golang and Rust. In Golang, you have Google behind the language and you have a lot of resources and a lot of smart people working in the core team and the standard library is quite big. Whereas Rust, you have Mozilla behind the, the development, but the funding and the resources are much more limited. So, and they are much more agile. So they, they go with a small, small core and kind of a crate based ecosystem for providing those additional facilities. Um, so, you know, trade-offs again, neither of the models is sort of um, directly better or worse, although most of the time the rich um, ecosystem for standard libraries wins, okay? And that's why C and C++, if, if you're observing it, they started, for example, with C not having facilities for multi-threading and uh, atomics, and they were doing it via third-party libraries. Now they're kind of doing it as part of the runtime system and as part of the core language. And the same thing happens with C++. It gets more and more stuff thrown into the standard library, such that you don't need boost, you don't need those additional libraries to achieve certain common things that you often use, right? Um, and that's kind of the trend that the, the, the core library support gets kind of more fat and, and, and richer. <clears throat> okay, so um, example of a lazy language. Wh which uh, languages that you know are lazy? Yeah, Haskell, do you know any other? Python can be lazy, yes. Um, What does it mean that the language is lazy? Is Rust a lazy language? Or language with where you can express certain things lazily? Yes, it can. Um, so laziness means that you can deal with infinite sequences or infinite lists, for example, because you don't enforce uh, evaluation on everything kind of explicitly. You can do it when something is needed, right? So some languages like uh, um, Java, uh, typically are not lazy, but you, in terms of collections, you can instantiate and operate on some types of collections in kind of a uh, lazy form, right? Um, the laziness is not kind of built in and it's not everywhere in the language, but in some use cases, you can do that, right? So you have kind of a pure lazy languages like Haskell, uh, and then you have some languages which, are, which can have kind of a laziness throw in. Right, so that's um, the first batch of, um, let me see if I clicked, yeah, all right. So then let's talk a little bit about the programming. Um, so what's the difference between concurrency and parallelism? Is concurrency and parallelism the same? No, it's not. What's the difference? So from, from programming. Um, yeah, so async versus uh, synchronous things. Um, but uh, let's say, Uh, what what would you use um, 
let's say you, you're doing something in C++, what would you use for concurrency? What sort of concept would you use for concurrency? Like the core fundamental thing that you need to use. Threads, of course. So in C++, if you want to do concurrency, you would use threads. In C++, if you want to do something in parallel, what would you use? What would you have to use? Yeah, you would need to have some form of multi-core processor uh, or a GPU, for example, and then you need to use some facility which allow you to do multiple things at the same time. So for example, you could use, um, I write in the chat, um, SIMD. What SIMD stands for? So this is kind of a fancy term for saying, for example, um, on x86, um, you have, yeah, so single instruction, multiple data, uh, and SSE is like a, um, extensions to the CPU instructions such that you can do the same thing on multiple registers or multiple things, right? So then using multi-core processors or using GPUs, you could actually have multiple things being done at the same time, right? So that's what parallelism is. Parallelism means that we have multiple things done at the same time, exactly at the same time. Whereas concurrency means that things happen kind of sort of at the same time, but you can have it done on a single CPU. It's just that the CPU context switch, right? So I'm kind of playing some music, but at the same time doing some calculations and they kind of happen at the same time. But if you look closely at one time slot, only one thing is happening always, right? So the, the simulation of them being concurrent kind of gives us the perception that things that two things are happening at the same time. But in reality, concurrency doesn't imply parallelism. Whereas parallelism requires you that if you look closely, those two things were actually happening physically at the same time, right? Okay, encapsulation. I'm running uh, out of time, but let's do one more. So encapsulation, What what is it? This one is actually quite complex. We will be dealing with this through this course quite a lot. Um, but how do you consider, what do you think encapsulation is about? From, from one point of view, it is about abstraction, yes, but mm, it's a little bit more than just abstraction. Yes, exactly. Sebastian is, is correct. It's about isolating things. So they don't, um, you know, they don't overlap with one another, right? So if I go, um, again, if I have, um, if I have, you know, some block of code, I have some code and then I start in, in, uh, in Rust, I start a block and I kind of uh, declare uh, a variable, right? So kind of let, let's assume it's a C++ type of thing, right? So I, I, I declare a variable. The variable is not visible outside of that block, right? So I kind of isolate it and kind of encapsulate it, this variable just to this block, right? So um, encapsulation is about isolating things such that they don't interfere with other parts of the system. So in object-oriented programming, we often create um, uh, a class which kind of encapsulates certain state and certain behavior in that class kind of concept such that I'm, I'm kind of encapsulating it, right? I'm isolating it from other classes which have other state and other behaviors. Um, but I can do that in a kind of a block, block way or if I have um, if I have uh, kind of a, let's say now it's a Go, Golang. Yeah, you, you don't necessarily know Golang syntax, but let's say I have a function. So I, I have a kind of a function here, which um, has some name and some parameters and it, it's doing something. And I kind of uh, declare another function um, 
at yeah, it doesn't matter if it's Golang or, or something else, right? Now, this function g is only available and visible within the context of function f. I cannot go outside and, and call g here because g doesn't exist, right? So I have encapsulation on the kind of a function level here as well. I isolated the definition and the usage of function g to the context of function f, right? Um, all right, so we're running out of time. Um, historically, we, we did sometimes go over time, uh, but uh, we are discouraged to do that with students, so I will have to stop. Uh, we didn't cover everything I was planning to cover today, so we will continue tomorrow. Uh, that will often happen, uh, especially because I am running the course for the first time and I don't know exactly how much I can squeeze in and how much I will be ranting about. Um, so we often have kind of a stop and then continuation kind of tomorrow. Um, what we will do tomorrow, we will finish this lecture and uh, we will talk a little bit about I.O. and about um, standard input and standard output and about piping. Uh, and also I would like you to uh, install Haskell uh, on your system. So if you could, um, you know, Google how to install Haskell on the Windows or Linux or whatever you're using and just install the runtime system such that if you go, um, uh, let me just quickly quit here. So if you go and you say uh, cargo, uh, not cargo, <laughs> cargo is for Rust. Uh, if you go, um, uh, yeah. If you go stack GHCI, you will get into the command line uh, interpreter of Haskell, right? I'm, I'm using stack for managing the, the Haskell installations and it's kind of convenient because then you can easily update and uh, keep things in sync. So I kind of encourage you to use stack as well um, and um, install it such that this command will run for you. Uh, if you in the installation mode, install cargo and install uh, Rust app as well and install Rust on your system too. Um, so if you could install Haskell um, and Rust, uh, I'm using um, yeah, cargo and Rust app for Rust and I'm using uh, stack for the Haskell system, right? To, to manage my, my Haskell. Uh, you don't need to install any IDE or any additional support for those two languages. Just make sure that you can uh, run Rust and Haskell on your command line. Yeah, we can have a chat after the class. I have some time. So I will stop recording and I will close the, the lecture so people can leave. Um, and then we continue tomorrow from from, let me see what was next, uh, from types. Okay, so let me just stop, um, stop the share and I will stop recording and then